Next, we'll hear proponent testimony from Jonathan Mann from the Ohioans to stop executions. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Jonathan Mann. Um, elegance and brevity are not personal strong suits, but I will try. Uh, before I read an abridged version of my testimony, um, I would like to say something. Uh, it's an important issue. I don't think that the gravity is lost on anybody in this room that's within earshot. Uh, I'm not the only person who's gone through this. I do represent others who have gone through it. And what I would like to reiterate to the chairman and the committee and everyone listening is that when we leave this building, when we go to our homes, when we tuck our kids into bed and we go to bed at night, I know of one person in this room that is going to have to deal with this every single second, every single minute of every single day of every single year. And that is me, Jonathan Mann. I have the unfortunate opportunity to share with you the experience of having my father ripped away by murder and how the death penalty has impacted me and my family. My journey and suffering mirrors closely with every single person I've spoken to who's lost someone to murder. While our circumstances differ, we are part of a fraternity that bonds us for life. When I talk about what happened to my dad, it's like opening up a vein, bleeding out, and recauterizing the wound. The experience is agonizing and traumatic every single time. I share the most painful experiences of my life with strangers over and over again, hoping and praying that someone is listening. Are you listening? The night of June 21st, 2017, my phone rang. It was a friend I had grown up with in Cleveland. He told me about finding out about how my dad had been murdered, the shock of it all, and to share what little information he had. He'd been watching the news that night and he recognized my grandfather's house. He'd been there a million times. He had no idea I was unaware of what happened. That's how I found out my father was murdered. The following two years were hell for me. I couldn't afford to bury my dad. That's a hard fact to face, to type, and to say. I applied to the Victims of Crime Fund for help with burial and counseling, but my dad had drugs in his system, so that made me ineligible to receive help for the funeral. And because I didn't live in the house with him, I didn't qualify for counseling assistance. And then the legal system offered a fresh version of hell. I was led to believe that I had people in my corner, the state, the prosecutor's office, was working for justice for me and my family. Certainly, that's what the prosecutor was telling the TV cameras. But as it turned out, they didn't really care about me or my opinion. I began asking questions about the appeals process. I was told death was the only option. The prosecutor, Michael O'Malley, had no interest in exploring alternatives. As time marched on, it was clear this case was his way to continue looking tough on crime, bolster his political career, and generate a good stream of press. The cost of all of this, it was paid by me and my family, and it was steep. The pain of having to wade through the death penalty case was high. No one explains how there are people who have been on death row for decades waiting execution. They don't talk about the, fame, the pain that we face with years of appeals, reliving the horror over and over again. We're still left with the void that someone we cared about is gone. With a person, while the person that caused our pain may eventually go away too, that doesn't fill the void that's in our hearts. Susan A. Bandes is the Centennial Dis Distinguished Professor of Law Emeritus at DePaul University. In a January 8th article written for the Crime Report, Professor Bandes explored the misleading myth of closure for victims' family members. Quote, the most telling finding is that a number of family members feel relieved simply because they're finally free of the legal system, Bandes wrote. Quote, as Matthew Shepard's parents and the Richard family, victims of the Boston Marathon bombing, understood, much of the pain comes from the capital system itself. Lengthy, heart-wrenching proceedings in which the family would be called to testify and the defendant would remain at center stage for years to come. I would like to reiterate, without citing it, the 2012 Marquette Law Review study that was already echoed. I agree with that sentiment. I have personal experience. The pain that this process has caused me is vast. 
With Michael O'Malley at the helm, Cuyahoga County led America with five death sentences in 2018 and 2019. One of those was my father's case, all while Ohio has no means of executing anyone. Also at the same time, the Attorney General's office lists 44 cold cases in Cuyahoga County. This is on top of scores, maybe hundreds, of open and unsolved cases that have yet to go cold. Remember, the last year the FBI noted that an average of 40% of homicides go unsolved. Ohio, excuse me, uh, they won't find much help with resources. And I can speak to that personally because Ohio couldn't help me with the $6,000 funeral bill to bury my father after he was murdered. But they decided it was worth it to shell out millions of dollars more than they needed to to seek a death penalty that will probably never be used rather than end the case in a way that would have left the community safer and spared my family of decades of additional pain. In a wake of tragedy, families like mine need support. We need help burying our loved ones. We need grief counseling. We need financial assistance when we can't make it to work. We need childcare when we have to go to court appearances. We need help navigating the sudden loss of a breadwinner. But between 2018 and 2020, there was a 67% drop in VOCA funds awarded to Ohio. That's from 117 million to 58 million. Attorney General Dave Yost was quoted saying, quote, if we don't get help in the next year or two, you're gonna see significant parts of the state that just don't have any access to service. Ohio is wasted money chasing sentences it won't carry out and leaving impacting families twisting in the wind. My family and I have become trapped in the legal system. There is no end in sight, and family members of murder victims wait decades for the process to end. There is no path to closure, healing, or justice in sight. This situation, it's quite common. Proponents of the death penalty often say we need the death penalty for victims, but do not address the reality of what that means. How does this sound like justice to you? Do you think I can feel closure having to wait at a minimum of 15 years? before my dad's killer exhausts his appeals? I have no choice but to focus on the appellate process every step of the way. Michael O'Malley could have worked out a plea agreement and ended this case years ago. The cumulative pain from the case waiting and uncertainty is toxic. The well-being of family members of murder victims isn't focused on even remotely as much as chasing headlines and sound bites. How much more sacrifice do family members of victims need to provide to facilitate change? It's time to end this wasteful and ineffective form of justice. If I could help prevent one person from going through the harrowing experience of a death penalty case, I would do whatever it took. I have never done anything more valuable as a human being than what I'm doing right now. Giving myself to something far greater than me has provided purpose and comfort. This isn't a job. I do this to honor my father and to stand up for the people who can't do it themselves. I don't clock out, I don't stop, and I will never give up. Thank you so much for your testimony and certainly thank you for sharing your story. It definitely makes Thanks, a difference. And thank you. Any questions from committee? No, Senator Fetter? Thank, thank you, and thank you for your commitment in sharing this um, with us. Because while you're waiting, um, for this process to end. You're also reliving it every time you're fighting to end the death penalty. So thank you for that. Um, through your experience, have you found others, other families like yourself who feel the same way? Can you speak to uh, some of those families that are victims of this uh, process? Uh, Chairman, uh, Senator, yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I, I'm also the vice chair of Ohioans to stop executions. I got involved with this work uh, because of what happened to my father. Um, uh, yes, to answer your question succinctly, um, I specifically work with family members of victims um, in trying to find support resources for them, which is scarce in Ohio and beyond. And I also try to um, bring them through the process as much as possible as someone who's experienced it. I think the thing that I would describe as most important to all of you to understand is that if I could go back in time 
uh, to four years ago when I started going through this case with the knowledge that I have now. Um, sorry, your dad got murdered pamphlet probably wouldn't do, but uh, something close to it. Um, contacts, um, people to reach out to, support resources. These aren't things that we get. Um, the prosecutor's office uh, is the one who controls the, the services, and that's only during an active case. And as the, the previous speaker just explained, uh, not a lot of cases actually see the light of day. So yes, uh, to, to expand further, I would say that our views are similar. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you once again. Thank you, Chair.